Good afternoon. My name is Uvaldo Valdez. Today is September the 3rd, 2013. This afternoon we're interviewing um, Emma Gomez Martinez, a longtime resident of uh, Boulder County, presently living in the city of Arvada, Colorado. This interview is part of the Boulder County Latino History Project which is a, a program of the Maria Rogers Oral History uh, Program. Our videographer in assisting with this interview is Liz McCutcheon. Good afternoon, Emma. Good afternoon. Good. Uh, Emma, we're going to spend a little time just having a little conversation this afternoon, okay? All right. Tell us, if you would, please, just to um, um, establish some uh, background information. Where and when were you born? I was born in Aguilar, Colorado, uh, January the 1st, 1928. Very good. And what can you tell us about uh, the family that you came into? Well, <clears throat> they were migrant workers, particularly of following the coal mines. And they would work in the mines in the wintertime, and in the summertime they would do farm work. Mm -hmm. And you say they're migrant farm workers, originally from where? Okay, my father was born in um, Old Mexico, Chihuahua, Old Mexico, and my mother was born in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, my father came over in the early 20s because um, it was during the war years and they, the army was uh, going through all these countries and counties uh, picking up young men by force to serve in the armies. Mm -hmm. This was in Mexico? This was in Mexico. I see. Yes. So your, your, your father um, decided to come to the United States and was his destination actually Colorado or he made his way up? He made his way up from New Mexico into Colorado. Mm -hmm. And what can you tell us about your, your mother's family? My mother's family, my great-grandmother was a Comanche Native American Indian. Mm -hmm. And my mother was born in New Mexico, and when she married my father, she came with him following the mines and the workers into Colorado. Mm -hmm. And we settled in Erie in 1929. Okay. And, um the union between your father and uh, your mother resulted in uh, what? Uh, describe your family for okay, us. Would you? I have. Uh, they had six children. I have three sisters and two brothers. And they are living. They have both died. Uh, my father's been dead now for uh, oh, twelve years, and my mother about sixteen years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, in, the, in the state of Colorado, was Boulder County the first county that uh, they settled in? or No, they settled in Weld County in Erie, Colorado, right across the line of Boulder County. In the wintertime, my father and the family moved into the city of Erie. And in the summertime, uh, about a quarter mile into Boulder County, working on the farm. And that went on for, for many years. Mm -hmm. And economically, what was it that your father and your, your parents did to raise their family? What kind of work did they do? Well, my father was a miner, and like I said, he worked in the farms in the summertime. My mother was at home with the children. Um, so your first recollection of living in this area, was that in the area of Erie, Boulder, or in general, Boulder County? Well, Boulder County became the, the main city that we uh, worked around because I went to work in Boulder County. I was 17 years old and I graduated from high school and I went to Boulder to work. Mm -hmm. And what high school did you graduate from? From Erie High School. Erie high school. Okay. Um, tell us then, in as much detail as you can, what was it like growing up in, I'm going to say, Weld and or Boulder County? What were the political and social dynamics uh, of the time? Um, uh, and what shaped those, those attitudes, the social and political attitudes 
and um, uh, I'll guide you through this. How have these things changed? Well, uh, I have written a letter to my children and my grandchildren because they were very young when I first started to become interested in what was going around um, the confrontations with the Anglo community uh, wasn't too well what should I say we didn't interact very much with them because we had the Spanish community and we had the Anglo community in those early years there there wasn't much socializing mm -hmm. uh, when we started school my father and my mother um, enrolled my sister who was a year older than I into kindergarten and they enrolled us together because discrimination was quite strong in those years and they thought that being together we would help each other mm -hmm. and we had they had many instances of discrimination some that I've documented in this letter that I've written for my mm -hmm. children and my grandchildren um, focusing in on your early years when you were a child yourself are, is there any one particular incident that you would like to relate for for the sake of this interview well it's kind of hard to choose from so many um, probably the one that has been in my heart and in uh, my memory was the first time that uh, there was a health program in the schools and they were examining all the children for hearing and eyesight etc well my sister and I were in the second grade and we were not examined what they did was pinned a note on our shirts and send us home and my mother read the note and immediately whipped off her apron called the neighbor over to take care of the baby she got a hold of our hands and she marched us back to school right through town to the schoolhouse and up the west stairs and into the office of the principal she opened the door and she walked in and she said I'm Mrs. Gomez and these are my daughters and I'm going to sit in this chair and every oh I guess I missed something the note said that Julia and I had lice and we could not go back to school until a doctor cleared us. Like I said, my mother marched into the school and walked into the principal's office. She sat on a chair and she told them, I will sit here and every lice you find on my girl's head, I will eat. Well, apologies were all over the place after that. And I'm so proud of my mother. She was a young, uneducated mom uh, fighting for her for her girls mm -hmm. are you able to generalize any of these uh, situations from your family out into the the greater community well yes because as a child uh, I do remember another story where my father took me to Longmont <clears throat> and we saw all these old beat-up trucks and cars uh, filled with uh, Mexicans and all their belongings. The men were on the running boards hanging on to the cars as they were driving south. We understood that the the Anglos in the community had decided that the Mexicans were not welcome and they were escorting them out of the town. Uh, they had uh, for what my father said, they had hired uh, Anglos from other countries to replace the Mexican workers in the farms, and they didn't need them any longer. Mm -hmm. Was your father or were you aware of what the destination was? Where did this program intend to take these, these people? None other than they were supposed to just get out of Longmont and they were heading south. Mm -hmm. And the chatter around there was, go back to Mexico, where you came from. Yes. And this was the explanation that your father gave you since you were, you were a child? Is that yes, right? yes. Uh -huh. They were picking up people right off of the streets 
and if they didn't have papers or whatever the officers demanded, they threw them in trucks and cars and escorted them out of the city. Now with respect to this particular incident, uh, since you, you, you witnessed that they were picking up people, uh, were you affected? Well, yes, I was made aware that Mexicans were not wanted. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I would observe discrimination, and since I was very young, there wasn't too much one could do about it. But my mother did, and father did do some uh, assistance in these moments of such hurtful discrimination. Uh, and my father said that the only thing to do was follow the law, don't break the law, and Oh. Well, I get emotional because they were they were such great people, and to uh, be fair about anything that you encountered. Mm -hmm. Were you and your, your 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 father, who was walking along with you that day, in any way threatened to also be picked up? No, my father happened to have blue eyes. And so we were just on the street, and he told me that they stay close by him, and we were not molested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, moving on then to a few years later, when you were growing up, you were uh, th by that time a young lady. So as a young lady working, uh, growing up in this area, what memories do you have that might have shaped who you are today? something from that particular era that might have some way somehow told you these are the things that I have to do in order to get or to establish a goal for myself and how to get there. How did these uh, memories or do you have memories of what it was that uh, uh, was this turning point and and what you did about it? Well no I, uh, I really don't recall any moment of change, it just sort of something that you did every day and you observed and helped if you could. Uh, many, many discrimination uh, moments passed over the years and I have put them down on this letter to my children, but I don't remember ever just saying, well, this is what I'm going to do. It just I was there when this happened, and I did what I could, and many things happened. <laughs> Can you share with us the source of uh, some inspirational moments or the source of uh, uh, any activity that was very positive for you that uh, sort of made you uh, uh, think about yourself and what you needed to do in order to survive, in order to make some progress? Well, um, uh, having been married for a few years and our children were quite young, uh, I became interested in being an advocate for Spanish-speaking people, in part because Mr. Ted Tedesco had asked me to be a volunteer interpreter for Spanish-speaking people that came before the council and their problems. So that's where my activities began. And uh, from 1965 to 1977, these are programs or things that I undertook. And these are memories that you, you feel good about? Yes. Okay. Yes. Actually, that was going to be our, our next topic that we were going to discuss. Let, 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 me, let me ask you to go back and, and still, let's still talk about your growing years, okay, for, for just a little bit. And let's talk about the, um, the economic activity in, in Boulder County. Mining and agriculture, you've already clarified for us that uh, those were the two primary um, economic activities in Boulder County. Um, how did this work 
the work source affect the livelihood of the Hispanic community in general, if not necessarily your family, the community that you lived in? Well, in, the, in those years, Spanish-speaking people were very quiet about all these problems. You heard about them when families got together in weddings or parties or something, and they discussed it within themselves. But I never remember anyone saying, well, we must do something about it, or we didn't get any advice from uh, those in power to change the discrimination and lack of employment, lack of education, uh, and looking for work. Those were things that were discussed privately in homes. I understood that they were embarrassed because once you feel this discrimination, uh, it kind of uh, scorches your soul. It's, it's not too hard to understand, but it keeps people it keeps people down. You don't have uh, the courage to to voice it and get out and do something about it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, what other occupations, to your recollection, existed in Boulder County? I know that uh, the university has always been there. The sugar mills out in in the Longmont area were there. Were there other? Um, well, those. Talk to us about those those. Uh, uh, sources of, of employment and any others that you may think of? Well, uh, really, I can't remember too many, like uh, CU uh, employed a few people as janitors. Um, I don't recall that the city of Boulder had any Spanish-speaking people working for the city. Uh, I don't recall any, any people of Hispanic uh, Heritage working in any offices, and very few people that you would see in these jobs that are in public. It was mostly um, maids for hotels, uh, construction. If by chance they would they would get hired, which was very few. Um, the laundry was there that hired people. Uh, Really, not not too many that you could see. It, the Boulder, the city of Boulder didn't want uh, lunch pail workers in the city. Mm -hmm. That was public knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, housing well, was not available. Uh, jobs were not available, and there were a few Spanish-speaking families that really resided in the city of our, of Boulder. Now, would it be a real stretch to ask you? Uh, to describe for us or to recall and describe for us were there any any private enterprises any stores uh, mercantile companies that were headed or owned by uh, the Mexican people in in Boulder or Well County not one that I recall uh -huh. even your neighborhood grocery stores no wouldn't that, that wouldn't that be okay well thank you for that now we move to uh, the topic that uh, will lead us to, to learn why Emma Martinez was a force to be reckoned with. Okay? Um, you are obviously, you are recognized as a longtime advocate for the underrepresented in Boulder, Boulder County and the area. What led you to assume that responsibility and what strategies did you use to be effective? Talk first of all is how did, how did, did people begin coming to you? How did you take on the responsibility of being the, the primary spokesperson for the Hispanic community and the underrepresented, which not all of them we know were, um, were uh, Spanish-speaking individuals? Well, it was quite a surprise to me when I received invitations to become or appear in front of these different uh, community um, programs. Uh, I uh, was asked by Mr. Ted Tedesco if I would go and represent uh, the Spanish-speaking community. To begin with, like I said, uh, as an interpreter for Mr. Tedesco, and then and, I and tell us who Mr. Tedesco was. Mr. Tedesco was the city. I forgot. 
the city ma the city manager, I believe it was at the time. Yes. Uh, for Boulder. For Boulder. For the city, for of, Boulder. For the okay. city of Boulder. Mm -hmm. And and what was he asking you to do? To interpret for the Spanish-speaking people that uh, had problems, and the city wanted to. Uh, recognize and see what they could do about these problems that were coming before the city. Mm -hmm. And tell us what some of those uh, specific uh, um, situations were where you were involved as an interpreter. Well, uh, in the 1950s, uh, influx of not, not uh, Mexican workers, but these were just general Spanish-speaking population from other states that were coming to Boulder. Evidently, they heard about this beautiful city and the university, and there might be a chance to work. So they would come into the city, and by the, of course they didn't have any jobs, they didn't have any money. <clears throat> so they were referred by various peoples to the Welfare Department of Boulder County. The Welfare Department uh, system of helping these people was to give them food for the day and enough gas for them to go back to Nebraska to Garden City and that took care of the problem. Many, many instances of this activity uh, we documented for the OEO board. Mm -hmm. And what was the OEO? The OEO board was the Office of Economic Opportunity. Uh -huh. uh, this was a program that uh, the county commissioners uh, began, and this is the board that I was asked to serve on to help them uh, recruit members for the board. And, and what is it that the board was was, was uh, charged with uh, with doing? To uh, find out the status of the poor of speaking Spanish families in the county of Boulder. And we did document many instances of discrimination, uh, education opportunities, uh, job opportunities, uh, uh, housing for people in Boulder. And so the OEO board took this and made a, and applied for a grant and they received a grant that uh, would help define these problems and see if something could be done about it. Now was this OEO program, uh, was this part of President Johnson's war yes. on poverty? Yes. So it was during that era right. of uh, President, President Johnson. Now Beyond the the assessment of the issue or the of the problem, uh, what are the kind of programs were initiated at, at that time to make the people prepared for assuming the jobs that you would be finding for them? Oh, you know, my memory. Were there some educational programs, some training yes, programs? Yes, in, in fact, uh, in? the city of Boulder had Quonsets across the street from where I lived, which is now the park that we were discussing. And we made offices there. The city allowed us to use those concert halls for educational purposes, for health purposes, to enroll children in um, programs that would help them in their studies. Uh, many volunteers came to help us out. And these programs, became very popular and we started uh, other programs, one in Lafayette and one in Longmont, and uh, they expanded and we had uh, job training, uh, educational programs, uh, and the community supported many of these programs. Um, of course there were some programs that that uh, needed much more attention and uh, these were studied and the staff of the OEO centers 
uh, expanded on, on many. Now, other than yourself, were there other minority individuals who also became uh, members of the board? Were you the only minority representative on that board? For a long time, I was the only member on that board, but then in later years, there were there were Spanish-speaking uh, board members. Mm -hmm. Any blacks? Did the community, the black community, were they uh, yes, uh, visible I, I, in, in the city of Boulder? There was, uh, there were um, about four or five families of Well, I don't know what the terminology is today, but they were they were black families that resided right in the area of, uh, of Water Street, Goss Street, Grove Street, and we had later in later years a member of the board mm -hmm. that represented the black community. How about Native Americans? Oh, uh, and and or Asians? No, I don't recall specific. Uh, Native Americans, except myself, I suppose, from my heritage, just from my great grandmother, that was a Comanche Indian. Now, um, moving away from the pro programs that you were responsible for, uh, just as 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 a family or as a community, what was the rela relationship between the few blacks? that were in Boulder at the time and the Hispanic group uh, in Boulder and Boulder County? Well, they, they got along very well. There were uh, probably 10 Spanish-speaking families right around this, this area. Uh, I think there must have been about four black families and some Italian families. And there were many children, and they all got along very well. Uh, I recall that my husband said that he would go to um, the movies when he was a young man with his friend who was a, a black young man and they were restricted, the black people were restricted from sitting in the main floor of the movie house and John would sneak up and be with his friend in the balcony while the ushers would see him with his black friend, and they would make John go downstairs. Uh, so they were friendly. They they had many friends, and they would socialize together as children. Very good. And uh, geographically in Boulder, this uh, this was the area. What streets do you recall uh, being the borders or the the area where these communities lived? Seventh uh, Street between Seventh Street and Thirtieth Street, and. Uh, Water Street, Goss Street, Grove Street, up as far as Arapaho is where these families lived. Okay, now my understanding is that Water Street was the original name of Canyon Boulevard right now. Right. Okay, good. Um, One of the first Incidents that I recall is in the early 19 in the 1950s. A group of uh, speculators had uh, approached the city of Boulder to name this area that I'm speaking about as the uh, ghetto, and they wanted to eliminate it. Well, the reason they wanted to eliminate the ghetto where these families resided was because uh, Water Street was planned on being converted to uh, Canyon Boulevard and the property would become very expensive. Well, well, John and I started a petition and, and uh, recruited many of our neighbors and we took it to the city that we were against this urban renewal plan because this is where we resided. Okay, it was our community. Let me stop you there for a minute okay. because you mentioned uh, a very important name. Um, along with all the work and uh, the observations that you made while you were growing up, somewhere along the line uh, a certain young man by the name of John Martinez came around. Tell me about who John Martinez was and uh, how he became a part of your life. Well, John Martinez 
lived in Boulder uh, most of his life. His family moved to Boulder because they liked what they found uh, very little discrimination as compared to other cities, particularly Denver, that they had resided. And his father, and his father um, became one of the people that worked in the mines in the winter and in the summertime took his family out to the farms to work. Um, John was uh, a soldier in the Second World War and we came back. I had just moved into Boulder to work and uh, he wanted to know who the new girl in town was because there weren't too many Spanish American peoples in the city at the time. Well, we met and were married, and that's who John Martinez was. I, we were married in 1947. Now that had to have been one of those high moments, <laughs> happy moments for you in, in your growing years. Yeah, that was quite interesting. If. He had looked for trouble, and he found it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you for that. Um, now, you were involved in a lot of things in the uh, civic realm, in the political realm, and uh, in the social realm of your community. Um, discuss with us, if you would, how were you able to balance the responsibilities as a mother a community advocate, a civic leader, and the go-to person for the uh, Hispanic community in Boulder? Well, it so happened that I really don't know. I know that uh, my husband was a great supporter of all these causes that I brought home uh, to discuss with him, and he supported me in all these, in all these programs. And uh, we were young. And we were in good health. Um, he had a job, and we could maintain our our family. And I put a lot of time into these different programs, and and he was totally supportive uh, in all these endeavors. Very yes. Good. Were all your children born in Boulder? Uh, my oldest son was born in Illinois. My husband had gone <clears throat> to school under the GI Bill, and uh, we were over there for over a year, and then we came back to Boulder. I see, I see. Emma, we're about to begin to summarize and to, to end our interview, but uh, uh, you're aware that you have recently been informed that you are to receive a long overdue recognition for your work by having a park in, 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 in Boulder named in your honor. Um, tell us about your reaction to, to this, this honor for yourself. Well, humility is a word that I feel, and I feel honored, and I feel honored for those that came before us who came to Boulder and opened up areas of, of work and employment and all the support we had from uh, the Anglo community when they discovered that there were areas where they might help. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm nervous and I have to go back to 1965 with these memories. And I find myself proud and sad that my husband was not here to share this wonderful dedication that we are to be presented with uh, October the 12th. Very good. Have you given some thought, any thought at all, to how the Hispanic community, whether they're presently in Boulder, were in Boulder and have now left, but who knew Emma Martinez, how do you assume that they feel 
with you having received, being uh, the one to receive this honor? You know, I've been so surprised and happy that I, d I really don't know. I, <laughs> I hope they're happy, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, that without a doubt. Without a doubt, without putting words in your mouth, there's no doubt but that the community will be there in full strength to support you. Um, so with that, Emma, we really are um, anticipating uh, that uh, this event that will take place in early October will be an event that the entire Hispanic community in the area will, will be able to enjoy and uh, feel very, very, very proud of. Are there any other subjects that you would like to discuss um, in this interview? Your children, your grandchildren? Uh well, like I said before, I would, I've written a letter to my children because they were very young uh, in these years that I worked on these programs, and so that they will know what this park dedication is about. But it's not just for Emma Gomez Martinez. It's for the Hispanic community who are being represented with this park for all to see that we are and will be a bolder citizens. And I would like to thank you want to close the door? And I would like and I would like to thank uh, Ted, Mr. Ted Tedesco. Uh, Lloyd Throne, uh, Hank Adamai, for the support that they have given not only to the poor but in particular to the Spanish-speaking peoples of Boulder County. And my admiration goes to Uvaldo Valdez and Philip Hernandez who continue in this endeavor to make certain that the Spanish-speaking community is recognized in the city of Boulder and elsewhere. And I want to thank my sister who brought the park story to Uvaldo and Philip. And so here we are, uh, time to celebrate. Very good, thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, we've enjoyed our, our brief discussion, and I'm sure people who will uh, listen to this interview in years to come will find it very enriching and will find information in it that, that will help them to, first of all, know their history and know what to do with it. So thank you. Well, thank you.